How many times have you heard in the last few years of someone overdosing on drugs? I mean, I feel like it's every year that you hear someone famous, a celebrity, who's passed away of, of a tragic overdose or even an accidental overdose. It's really sad, you know. And, and remember when we were kids, uh, when we had uh, Scruff McGruff, I think it was, and he told us, hey kids, don't do drugs. And remember, he always used to say, Now, what are you going to say if someone asks you to try drugs? Hey, I don't need drugs because they can make me goofy. I mean, drugs have to be bad for you, right? They, they harm people, they hurt people, people overdose on them. Drugs can't be good for you, can they? And, and then also think about this. Uh, the elderly get elderly abuse and taking so many different meds uh, from different doctors. The cardiologist isn't talking to the oncologist and the oncologist doesn't know what the PCP sent over. And there's all these medications. So there's no way that medications can be good for you, right? With everything, there's good and bad. But there are some good things regarding drugs, specifically controlled substances, that can be good for hospice and end of life, that can actually help the process. Let's talk about it real quickly. One of the biggest hot topics in hospice or home health is drug use. When it comes to drug use, how do you control drugs? What type of drugs do you use to help with patients who are in pain or anxiety at end of life? Those questions are so many questions that we get asked a lot. So this podcast, me and my wife, again, decided to walk through what are the top most common drugs that you usually hear at end of life? What are they for and how can they be used and how should they be used at end of life? If you're questioning about medications specifically like morphine or what comfort kits are this podcast is for you so enjoy this podcast you can always click through the chapters to fast forward or to figure out specifically what you want to listen to so i hope you en enjoy this podcast with myself and my wife emeline let's go <sighs> Woo! how's it going it's pretty good here Woo! again hey let's go hope you guys are doing good we're going to chat today about a few things, but I think one of the things that we were thinking about was questions that we get all the time regarding medications and comfort kits and morphine. Oh, that's a touchy subject. Yeah, and end of life medications and how are they used and what are they used for and why and how the heck does, can I say heck? Yeah, okay. I think that's how, the, how, how the heck does hospice cover medications? Like, what does that even look like? Like, you know, how does that process work? You know, so I think I think it's important first to give the caveat to our people that are watching mm -hmm. to to know that every hospice has different policies. Yeah, true. every hospice true. has different processes and procedures and. Yeah prescriptions and some of the medications I might talk about it could be very different yeah. or look different, but they're all treating relatively the same thing. Let's go into specifics. So like, let's talk about different categories or, or the top five medications that hospice companies use or hospice agencies use and why. What would you see like on, when you look at patients, you always usually see these type of common medications and why? I see uh, medications for hypertension all the time. Cool. That's a huge one. Um, hypertension or tachycardia, cardiac meds basically. Mm -hmm. um, most of those are covered by a hospice. Generally, if a patient is on any cardiac meds, um, we don't stop them because they could rush the patient's death. Mm -hmm. They could be at risk for a stroke or a heart attack or whatever else have you. Um, and so a lot of heart medications are frequently seen. Um, I see thyroid medications a mm. lot. That's not a hospice medication though. Um, it's not considered something that if we stop it, it will rush the death process. Yes, they may have some discomfort or side effects or whatever, but um, usually we keep it on as long as they can tolerate medications. Um, anything for pain, okay. pain's a big one. Yeah. So. Um, hospice covers anything that's related to your comfort, whether that's your pain, your bowels, your um, diuretics, um, anxiety, depression, all of those medications are all They related. come together. Mm -hmm. Do you ever see patients that are on like a lot of drugs 
And then when hospice comes in, they come in and kind of reconcile and review all those drugs and you see them actually kind of get better. That is a huge benefit uh, of hospice. Yeah. Yes. So polypharmacy is a huge issue in our country mm -hmm. um, because we have so many doctors and so many specialists and everything else. Mm -hmm. It's so common for us to one doctor to prescribe some X, Y, Z, and then another doctor or another specialist to provide ABC. And then those two doctors don't talk to each other because mm. they're in different networks or different whatever, and they don't see all those meds. That's the main reason why any doctor you go see asks for your med list because yeah. it, it gives them an idea. But if there's two or three meds that are newer or aren't on your med list, they don't know, yeah. they might not recognize, oh, that's a bad idea to, right. to, to interact with another one. Yeah. It is so common for us to have six different specialists and all those different specialists are prescribing mm. different things. And so a lot of times our hospice comes in, one doctor and one nurse is looking at one med list that's comprehensive of all these specialists. Um, that doctor has a, you know, is usually an internal medicine or a geriatric doctor. Right. They can say, well, these two are probably interacting negatively with that. But also it's a big thing too, because we talk about like vitamins, like, Supplements are important, yeah. yes. Um, cholesterol medications are important, but at this stage of life, are they really benefiting your loved one? What is the pro versus con of them? Is their body digesting those properly? And mm. um, we go through all of those things. So it's super beneficial to have our hospice doctor look at the med list and kind of do a, mm. a once over. Um, our policy is to just make recommendations mm -hmm. and then the family can decide. And then I make it very clear, like whatever you decide to keep that the hospice doesn't recommend, you know, continuing, gotcha. we won't provide those medications. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. So sometimes that can cause a little bit of like, oh, you're messing up our process. I do the pill box Mondays every week, blah, blah, blah. That's where we always say, let me help you with the pill box. Yeah. I'll do the med refills. I can even call your CVS and order the refills, yeah. whatever else. Are there any medications that hospice is like, doesn't cover that are kind of like controversial medications? Blood thinners are a big one. Okay, uh, why? Blood thinners are a big one because generally when our patients are on hospice, they're end stage heart failure. Mm -hmm. And so, um, if their INRs or their PTs are really, really high, mm -hmm. they're at such high risk for internal bleeding. When you come on hospice, we're not doing imaging, we're not doing testing, we're not doing lab draws as frequently as your cardiologist might be used to doing mm -hmm. them. So it's a risk for you to be on them. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention when you're on hospice, generally you are a higher fall risk. Mm -hmm. If you were to fall and you're on Warfarin or Coumadin or Eliquis or any of those really expensive blood thinners, um, it's a big risk that yeah. you could even hit your elbow and internally bleed all in your elbow or wherever else. I mean, you just don't heal as quickly. Yeah. Um, generally, those patients' nutrition and their their body is just not filtering like it should yeah. be. Is there a reason why a family wouldn't want to stop like Eliquis or Warfarin or things like that in your experience? Like, yeah. is there a reason so why? Generally, I re we recommend to to stop a stop a blood thinner and use a safer blood thinner okay. well, such we'll, we'll as like, aspirin okay, yeah. um, yes aspirin is not as strong but it is a it's an effective blood thinner in the sense of it's still going to keep you um, anticoagulated mm -hmm. essentially um, the beautiful thing about aspirin is it's one safer because it does allow your blood to thicken a little bit so that it's not so um, so thin and so viscous that you know if you were to fall it's a, it's just safer mm -hmm. um, The other thing is it doesn't require that weekly monitoring So with warfarin or Eliquis, you do have to have regular lab draws and regular blood mm -hmm. or um, Finger sticks to check your PT INR. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do any of that monitoring with aspirin. So it is safer gotcha. um, It's also a cheaper option for sure mm. um, so that's a huge benefit to our medical system yeah, as a whole. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Well, so if I didn't know what PTINR is, like, what is PTINR? What is that? What's an INR reading? Or? So a normal INR is between two and three. Okay. Um, generally, if your your INR is higher, it means your blood is too thin. Okay. If your INR is lower, it means it's too thick. So it is. Viscous. A, it's very 
challenging to keep it in that range. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times like our very advanced heart failure patients go to a heart failure clinic um, before they come on hospice mm -hmm. and they're checking their INR weekly. So if they're on a warfarin or a Coumadin or a Eliquis or whatever else have you, they're checking their lab draws weekly the doctor may adjust or tell them to hold their warfarin for three mm -hmm. days, depending mm -hmm. on what their INR is. Right, right. Um, but on hospice, the other reason why we encourage people to go to a safer blood thinner is because it gets really challenging to monitor that and mm -hmm. keep you within a therapeutic range. Right, so right, that right. is the biggest challenge. Gotcha, gotcha. And your body is already declining. It is. The heart's just not working like it mm, should. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So. So those are kind of the top, you know, kind of. Those are the ones we see most yeah. frequently, but I will say every area of the country sees different things. Right. Right? Let's talk about different categories of drugs in terms of how it addresses patients where they're at in their disease process. So let's talk about like the most common uh, medications that hospices use for anxiety or what are some of those or any other drugs for anxiety and depression for patients. We like to use the safer ones. The problem with the anxiety and the depression medications, a lot of times starting them, is it's pretty common for mm -hmm. our patients mm -hmm. to be depressed at end of life. Yeah. Um, but the problem with a lot of those, those anxiolytics or um, SSRIs, is that those categories of drugs generally take time to get in your system and build up, right? Yeah. So, um, sometimes we don't have that time and so sometimes we're ending up using more faster acting or as needed medications mm -hmm. that might not last as long basically gotcha. Gotcha. um so if we're just talking anxiety in general lorazepam ativan um and then xanax is, or alprazolam those are our two really big go-to's um there are other drugs like valium or diazepam um, that you can use as well too. Um, there's just a lot of anxiolytics out there, and the biggest reason we use anxiety is because people have anxiety about dying. Yeah, yeah. Um, people have anxiety about their body shutting down, yeah. or, or the death process. You know, yeah. how is it going to happen? Is it going to be fast? Is it going to be painful? Yeah. Um, our families have anxiety about yeah. Yeah. about the death process, right. and so that's a very real thing. Uh, restlessness or um, we we have a term that we use frequently that's called terminal agitation mm -hmm. that near the end of life our especially our dementia patients there is just no amount of medication mm -hmm. um, no change in their their um, antipsychotics that can help them yeah. they really need to be heavily medicated with yeah. anxiolytics like Valium or uh, Xanax or lorazepam in order to stay calm right, to allow right. their body to go through that dying right. process wow. um, But usually that's a last resort thing and generally those meds are very closely monitored mm, okay. So I remember I was thinking about you just reminded me of a patient that we had like years ago that um, Like run on admission terminal diagnosis run on admission was like no morphine no morphine i don't want any morphine whatever mm -hmm. happens to me i don't want morphine mm -hmm. so i took time and chatted with him just to get to know him and and uh he was a a, a painter like a really good oil painter mm -hmm. and he he told me he said the reason why i don't want to take morphine is because he used to i forget the name but he used to follow a famous french painter mm -hmm. who died of a morphine overdose Aww. and he was like I'm not ever going to use morphine. And so I was like, well, that makes sense. Like, yeah, like, the, but did someone educate you on what morphine is used for at end of life mm -hmm. and how it is actually made to help mm -hmm. through through the end of life? And so I think we get that a lot, right? I think, I think, it, I think with anything, you know, fear comes with a lack of knowledge, mm -hmm. right? And so when you don't know something, you're going to fear because you're gonna assume. Right, so Valid. what is the purpose of morphine when it comes to patients at end of life? So, first of all, I want to address the elephant in the room. Where is it? Morphine is... Where's the elephant? Is, Where's is, the elephant? <laughs> morphine's one of those really big drugs that people just assume that... Like, you hear all the time people go on hospice and then they started the morphine drip and they died, right? Yeah. So... 
that's a common misconception that morphine makes you die or morph it's people think like morphine is like euthanasia right like yeah. they th that's the only thing you can think of to compare it. but yeah. um Morphine, and, morphine. And there's been some pretty bad cases, like just in Dallas. There has people, been. Like, there's been a lot of people abusing it. Yeah, yes. That are hospice, yes. unfortunately. Yes. Um, and so I think it, it really does get a bad rap, but I think uh, the morphine is used very specifically for pain or shortness of breath. Okay. So very frequently in the dying process, you have to think about it from head to toe one body system at a time is shutting down, right? Mm -hmm. And not in order, not like, oh, I can tell his feet are going, I can tell his arms are going, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. like, there are body systems that are slowing down. Maybe the kidneys go first and mm -hmm. they stop urinating. Maybe the lungs give out and, you know, it's extremely hard for them to breathe. Maybe the heart is giving out and it cannot produce that oxygenated blood. And so their, you know, their feet are getting blue, all the mm -hmm. things, right? As one body system after another is, shutting down to do the dying process mm -hmm. sometimes that is painful it's anxiety yeah. causing yeah. depending on how alert and oriented your loved one is yeah. that's it's very it's not normal. shocking it's, it's not normal it's not normal to them like imagine using your body for all of your life and then all of a sudden you're not able to use a part of your body yeah so it's it's scary and uh so we use things we use medications to help with the anxiety piece of that but as parts of the cardiovascular and respiratory systems are shutting down. Um, one may compensate for the other, mm -hmm. and as a result, shortness of breath is very common. So if you and I tried breathing 40 times a minute, that's very uncomfortable <coughs> for a long period of time. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable for a long period of time. Yeah. Um, pain is something that a lot of times we use nonverbal cues to to um, measure. So if they're grimacing, if they're clenching their arms, if they're, um, the vitals do adjust quite frequently at the end of life. So sometimes the blood pressure will go really, really high and then it'll just drop. Mm. Sometimes the heart rate generally is going really, really fast mm. until right before death. Sometimes the blood pressure is steadily dropping and dropping mm. and dropping and dropping and dropping and we know that death is close. Um, usually days to hours before death, we cannot get a blood pressure because it won't, it's just so low, yeah, the monitor yeah. doesn't even pick it up. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times, like I said, while all those body systems are slowing down, there is those side effects of pain or shortness of breath. Mm. Those beautiful scenes in movies mm -hmm. where people just die in their sleep. Gosh, I would love that yeah. for all of our patients. It doesn't always happen. But it, Sometimes. it doesn't happen yeah. for all our patients. Um, and a lot of times, even when patients have go into a cardiac arrest or have a uh, heart attack and then that causes their death, usually that's a split second mm -hmm. or that's a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. And they're here one day and gone the next. And, you know, all of us as a hospice team are looking at each other like, what happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but in those other cases, and in, in diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, um, congestive heart failure, mm. those are sometimes our longer, more extended deaths that do need some of those medications to yeah. keep them comfortable, to keep them peaceful. Um, and so there's a lot of education that we yeah, do at yeah. the end of life to explain why we need to keep them calm. Yeah. Because everybody wants a peaceful death yeah. for their loved one. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's not to rush the death. Now, the big thing about morphine, and it's very important I say this, is that it is a respiratory depressant. So mm. it is meant to slow down the respirations. Now, there's a very delicate balance of giving too much morphine mm. to slow down the respiration so much that they're not breathing at all. Yeah. What's, what's too much morphine? That's a great question. Because I think... We, you know, we'll have family members that, of course, we have morphine dialed up for that in specific cases, and then mm -hmm. the nurse will give and instruct them what to do. But sometimes they're like, how much is too much? All right, what is just a good, a good gauge for families to know how much morphine is too much? It really depends on the patient. If, if the patient has been on heavy drugs or have had serious chronic pain issues like they've been on methadone for mm -hmm. years they're going to go through morphine like and water and it's not touch them too yeah because it just they have a higher tolerance for pain medication um 
and we may need to use higher doses of morphine in order to keep them comfortable. Right. Um, other patients are 80 pounds and they've never had a lick of Tylenol yep. in their entire life. Yep. Okay, they're only going to need the teeniest, tiniest bit. Yep. So we give them a range. Um, and granted, the nurse is very involved in what we call titrating mm -hmm. um, medications to find the right dose. We always start small and go up. Yep. So... Uh, there are ways for us to monitor was that dose effective was it not do we need to go up was that dose overly effective right. and they are just so sedated and lethargic right. okay let's pull back right. um and all of that has to do with assessment and behavior yeah. and and you really do need a nurse holding your hand through yeah. it because yeah. we are experts in yeah. understanding okay that was too much we don't yeah. need to do that yeah. too yeah. much yeah. um morphine liquid um so some hospices will use a, a morphine pump, like if you have a port, mm -hmm. if you're a cancer patient and you have a port, some hospices will use a pump. Mm -hmm. um, we use liquid mm -hmm. medication, so oral liquid is a very small amount um, that just dissolved into their salivary glands. And so um, usually we start small with just 0.25 and then we'll go up and up and up depending on what their yeah. needs are. Um, how is their bodily, body handling these symptoms? Um, and then again, it just depends on what the needs are. Yeah, yeah. How is the patient handling it? Yeah. Um, morphine liquid doesn't stay in your body as quick or as long. As I'm long. sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so it usually what we do is our dosage accounts for giving it as often as every hour. Now, the smallest amount every hour over a 24 hour <laughs> can, period can of grow. time, yeah. people look at that and they yeah. think, oh my gosh, that's so much. In reality, it's not. Yeah. Um, I have other chronic pain patients who've had two full mils of morphine, which is 40 milligrams every hour for mm. days because mm. that's their chronic pain issue that they've been dealing with and they can't swallow their pills mm. anymore. So that's a big problem. There are other medications that are not pills that yeah. we can use in combination with the morphine. But again, all of that has to be so very carefully yeah. titrated, titrated and yeah. used. Yeah. So that we're not over sedating a yeah. patient. Um, yeah, and I think that's why I think that's why the relationship with the family and the nurse is so pivotal. Mm. And I think like I think having we talk about this all the time, but bedside manner, mm -hmm. soft skills, taking the time to educate mm -hmm. and address fears. Yeah, right. The nurses have to be um, Sherlock very, Holmes. Yeah, and they have, yeah. They have to be able to say like, if someone is yelling at you saying, no, I don't want morphine, I don't want morphine. It's probably a reason why they're saying oh, that. Yeah, for sure. And that's the opportunity for you as a nurse to sit down and say, what's going on? Like, what mm -hmm. what, what experience did you have? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm so sorry that you went through X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry about that. But for this situation, it's actually probably best that we do this. Yeah. And taking the time to do that will, will will save so much other effort, mm -hmm. right? And I think nursing, nurses, and not just nurses, but any nurse practitioners, doctors, or right? anyone who's administrating that specific medication, mm -hmm. they have to take time to educate families. Yeah, people, usually it is digging deeper into the grief, into the, yeah. the past experiences. It's figuring out, okay, <laughs> I get that you're scared of morphine. Tell me why. Yeah. Um, and, and explaining why that specific patient and this specific situation warrants the conversation yeah. about morphine. So once again, every hospice has their own policies and procedures. We don't like to put what we call a comfort kit in the home mm -hmm. until the patient, we're seeing declines that are patterns of, okay, we might need this in the right. next week to days right. or whatever else have you. So a comfort kit mm -hmm. is generally what we like to call like the nurse's toolbox basically. Mm -hmm. um, so it's got medications, generally it has morphine in it, generally it has lorazepam in it, or some sort of an anxiolytic. Um, 
And then it has medications for nausea, vomiting. It has medications for secretions. So very frequently at the end of life, people have heard about the death rattle. Mm -hmm. um, it's because as the body is slowing down, as the lungs are shutting down, it can't process those secretions you and I carry mm -hmm. every day. Every day, yeah. But we are standing upright. We are talking. We are coughing. We yeah. are eating. All of those things. The body has nowhere for it to go. So when they're laying in bed, they all just rattle around in here. Mm -hmm. It's not un comfortable to the patient but it's very hard it sounds it's very hard for families yeah, to hear yeah. and so for that reason we use a medication um to help dry up those secretions um now there are side effects to that too it's very drying to the mouth mm -hmm, um because mm -hmm. that's the purpose of it right. so if a patient is alert that may be very uncomfortable right, right. um but that's that's another big one that we use um and then uh, suppositories as well okay. for uh, like Tylenol is a big one mm -hmm. um, because fevers are common at the end of life the brain is not processing temperature like it should be um, and so it's very common for our patients to have fevers at the end of life and during the dying process mm -hmm. in those last I think that's days. really important to uh, like I feel like families don't realize that mm -hmm. too it's like whoa what's happening like is there an infection no it's your body is just shutting down yeah the brain is not processing temperature yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other one is constipation uh, suppositories mm -hmm. because sometimes our patients get so impacted or constipated generally right before they pass. This is the poop talk, mm -hmm. poop emoji. Yeah. Um, uh, generally, our patients get really impacted right before they um, they get they pass away, um, whether it's a change in their diet or their medications are have yeah, just lot, yeah. stopped up their bowels yeah. or whatever else have you, depending on how the body systems are shutting mm -hmm. down. Um, that sometimes you know we have to use a suppository to help them release all of that so that they are more comfortable. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and I think I think the crazy thing about it is that a lot of times you know when they think of like the word comfort kit, right? It's, it's, if you really think about it, this meant a comfort, mm -hmm. right? So each medication has a reason, it yes, has a purpose. Yes. And if it's, and if, and if families are educated on what each medication is actually meant for, it brings the family comfort. Yes. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. That's yeah. great. There's, there are times when, when families will refuse medications yeah. or they'll refuse yep. one or two of the, the right medications to, yeah. and they totally have the right yeah. to. Oh, I yeah. sadly have had patients who've passed away probably in pain, but that is mm -hmm. the family's right. right. We are guests in their home. Yep. Um, as long as I've done my job to educate and encourage mm -hmm. that um, this is what is best and what is right. recommended, right. Um, they do still have the right yeah. to refuse that. Okay. And that's that goes back to cultural barriers mm -hmm. a lot of times. Oh yeah, 100%. Yeah. I think there's a lot, you know, it's cultural barriers, it's beliefs, mm -hmm. it's religious beliefs, it's mm -hmm. it's everything you can think of. And so the hospice's job is to to present the knowledge, mm -hmm. right? And the, the family has the right to choose or not to choose Absolutely. at all times. But I think it's also, it's so important that the, that the hospice understands that they're there to present with care mm -hmm. with tenderness mm -hmm. and it's all also how you present it you could be brash and rough and present something mm -hmm. or you could be very kind and considerate and present something and someone will take it better yeah i think those are things that we see like a lot mm -hmm. um, any last kind of comments regarding medications for hospice uh patients for families anything that you would like to kind of chime in on before we end this video I personally, I do think you should advocate for your loved one in the sense that if the, the medicines in the comfort kit make you uncomfortable, ask the hospice not to send them out yeah. um, until it's time for those medications. Um, I think that every family has the right to decide what's right for them. They know their loved one the best. Yeah. Um, a lot of times facilities will ask us for a comfort kit early on and they just keep it locked up and that's totally fine. Um, you know, we'd rather have tools in our toolbox than go out to a visit and right. not have anything to work with. Right. Um, that's frustrating to us as nurses. So it is very on the, the, the knowest of the, no, the nurse to, to be able to know when it's time for that and time for that conversation. Yeah. Um, so, but I, 
I don't like to put those meds in people's homes um, until it's time because it makes people feel uncomfortable. It also makes them feel like they've got a ticking time bomb in their back of their fridge. Um, if there's little people in the home, that's always a risk mm. or a hazard. Um, so be safe with them, obviously. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is actually really good. So I know that said that was the last thing, but I think okay. I think it's important. Okay, let's talk about medication disposal, like really oh, quickly. That's an interesting topic. So I think like let's chat about just really quickly about how once a patient passes away, what's the medication disposal process? I know every hospice has their own policy, mm -hmm. but generally we can talk about our policy and what we do. Yeah. But just in general, what is that, and what it is is. Is it okay for the family to keep the medications and not dispose it? Let's talk about that whole process. That's a touchy subject. So oh, yeah. in Texas, we are not required to dispose of medications. As soon as the patient dies, the medications are technically the property of the medical power of attorney or the next of kin. Um, most facilities will ask us to dispose of those medications mm -hmm. um, on, during the death visit. Mm -hmm. um, so our process, my process is literally to destroy them in the sense that I put them in a Ziploc bag, um, empty everything into it, count it, have a witness, um, and then I will cover it with just Dawn dish soap and then throw it away. Mm -hmm. The Dawn dish soap obviously destroys it enough that if anyone were to put their finger in there and try to take an oxycodone out, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not going to do anything. Not gonna do anything. Yeah. Um, so we dispose of it that way. Other people will put it into a diaper and cover it with soap mm -hmm. um, and then just throw the diaper away. Other people will put it in a bag with kitty litter and add a little bit of water. It clumps together and then it's impossible Useless. to really separate. Um, the FDA actually recently um, has uh, released literature that it's okay to flush medications or pour them down the drain. Um, I don't recommend this, but again, the FDA says it's okay to do yeah. so that it is an option. Yeah. Um, and like I said, every hospice, every state has their own medication disposal policy. So it's best to ask your hospice um, what their policy is. Um, they do have the right to refuse you disposing it. So what we do on death visits is we will ask, um, what would you like to do with your loved one's medications? Um, and then if, if they do say, we want to keep them, I would clearly document that all mm -hmm. um, to cover mm -hmm. us. If yeah. we dispose of it, any narcotics get counted and witnessed. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, sometimes families will say, oh, that's just Tylenol. I'll, I'll keep it. You know, that's yeah. fine. Um, whatever else. So um, it's really the discretion of the nurse, mm -hmm. the family, all that stuff. But yeah. as long as everything's documented, it is up to the family to yeah. decide what they yeah. want to do. That's good. That's good. Awesome. Awesome. That was great. Well, that's all we got for today. If you guys liked this information, this video podcast or yeah. chat that we're doing, please like and subscribe. Also, if you want us to talk about other things, other topics regarding hospice care, palliative care, end of life, home health, we're going to do more home health stuff too. Mm -hmm. Please put in the comments, add some information in there. We will make do our very best to respond and uh, give you guys some good information. So hope you guys are doing well. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, that's all we got. God bless. God bless. Um, we out. Peace out. We out. Let's hope it recorded. Oh, Lord.